realized you got into jail for minor offenses, but that's fine. I thought you'd done something major. Anyway, so she told us a story. And what I want us to do is I want us to understand first what is stage presence. When you look at people on stage, what do you see about them? Please shout it out. It's okay. It's just, I want it to be engaging. What do you feel? When you see someone on stage, yes, please. You don't have to raise your hands. You're not in class. Say it. Just speak it out. Body language, yes. Connection. A connection. What else? Eye contact. How vocal they are. How clear their speech is. How clear their speech is. Okay. The mood they create. The mood they create. So how they make you feel. Yeah. No, okay. Fingertips. Fingertips. You notice people's fingertips. Yeah, because wow. it says okay. a lot about it. Okay. I'll try to hide mine. Uh, what else? Their clothing. Their clothing, yes. Okay, so most of you sort of got what it is all about, what you notice on stage. But let's expand that or maybe simplify that, okay? Stage presence really tells you about someone's energy, right? What do they portray, right? Sometimes, have you met people in life that on the first instance, either you click with them very well or you don't like them and you don't even know what they've done to you. That's energy. That's their aura. The other thing that a stage presence shows you is their confidence, their charisma, their attitude. Basically, it's authenticity. You can read or get through to someone by looking at all these markers that all of you mentioned. So what is on stage presence about? Let's break it down. If this is, I'm trying to be an artist here, hopefully this is a proper circle. If this is everything that you have to do on stage, okay? I would say about there and there. There are three elements that people look at you when they see you on stage. The three elements that people look for. These three elements come across whenever you're on stage. The first one is the biggest one. This one. This is body language. Someone said this here. This constitutes 55% of what people notice you with or for. The second one, this is 38%. This is your tone, your voice. And believe it or not, this is 7%. That's your words and the language that you speak. If on stage presence has to do with these three things and the majority of it being body language, let's look at what body language is, what are the things that make up a body language, and then eventually move on to the tone and voice. And how do we keep things in mind? How um, we can practice, we can rehearse on certain things that these, at least the first two, the majority of them, are taken care of. The words and language is re really related to your background, how you grown up, what language you speak, if English is your first language or not. And that also can be made improvements on with practice. But these two, it's fairly easy. And I say fairly easy because it's within you. Sawa, questions? So let's look at uh, Shirin Bai's story. When she was telling us a story, what do you think she was doing? What did she do? By the way, I'm assuming that you've heard the first two judges You've done the pre-stage things, which is content research, which is know your audience, which is, you know, do some studying about the topic that you're going to speak about, the content that you want to speak about. 
This is while you're on stage. So when Sharon was up there telling her story, what do you think she did? She's trying to engage you, yes. Trying to make you feel involved, right? What else did she do? How do you think her posture was? <coughs> you don't have to say positive things because she's a judge, <laughs> by the way. No, no, I take bribes, huh? No, she set the tone very nice and clear and very positive. So, like, you were hooked onto her. You wouldn't bet your eyelid, okay? Her story was interesting, you know, the way she was portraying. It was not like a flat tone, you know, it was nice. Okay, and did she make anyone, please? Okay, so high, her eye contact was on point and she was looking around, she made everyone feel involved, right? Was there anyone here that she maybe sort of felt, uh, made them feel not involved? Wait, wait. You? you felt intimidated by her? By her? Wow, okay. Shirin Bai, I didn't know you could do that. Yes, thank you. It was on purpose. Yeah. Watching how many of them are observing this, because the worst thing that you can do when you're standing is stand with your hands in your pocket. You'll get a rubber band, give her a rubber band. <laughs> but yes, you saw her not showing you her hands initially. But also, what did, you, did, she, did she not move around? She was just in one place, okay? She could have easily made that talk like I am by going around and telling you a story because everything can be your stage and everything can be your realm and everyone can be part of your story. It does not matter whether you are there or there or you can be anywhere because you will not always have that stage because your stage will never be on a podium because sometimes my audience will only be one person and I'll have to speak to only you or sometimes my audience will be all of you did you see the difference right so here are a few things that you can do when it comes to your body language number one it's what we call the area of influence from here to here. This is the area of your influence. There is a number of ways to make sure that you don't mess up. So, first of all, when you do these things, when you keep your hands in your pocket, you're taking away from your strength. Second, people like to look at your hands. If you feel you can't, you're not comfortable with your hands on its own, like I am, I'll always go here. I'll always paint a picture with my hands. Dr. Zoreda and Farhan's presentation was so high. I'm still trying to reach them. I'm trying to use my hands to paint a picture for you. If you're not comfortable, then you could easily use something like this that is small enough that can get away. But your hands need to be here. This is the power pose. Some people use it like this. Some people use it like this. Some people use it like this. This is your power pose. The second thing, when you show your palms, when you talk about things and show your palms, people trust you more. It's inherent in human beings when people show their palms. People trust more. So this is another trick that people use when they're on stage. Look at all the excellent speakers. They will always use their hands very, very well. They'll be able to show you a picture with their hands. They'll be able to paint things, make you imagine things with their hands. They'll be able to emphasize a point with their hands. They'll keep their palms open. So these are some of the things that you must me very careful about when you're up there. Your posture is another thing. So Shirin Bai 
even though she didn't move around. She stood her ground. She was strong. A lot of, a lot of times, and sometimes these things happen because it's habitual, we don't know. We come back like this, right? We go like this. We're like this when you're moving around. These are all your postures. These are all your body postures. Those are all weak postures. This is a strong posture. When you want to appear more confident automatically, and when you have your hands on your hips, you're already seeming more confident, as opposed to this, as opposed to this, as opposed to this. So your posture is very, very important when you're up there. We spoke about your hands, we spoke about the area of your, area of your power, we spoke about your posture, eye contact. Someone says eye contact. How do you think you make eye contact with everyone? Anyone? Try. How do you make eye contact with everyone? Yes. Mm -hmm. Do you agree with that? When I was going around, was I looking at everyone? Was I? Do you think? Am I? Am I? You spoke about this earlier. Yes? If you can have one comfortable person, you're looking around, but you can actually look people you're comfortable. Okay, so she spoke about anchoring. It's something that I also spoke about earlier. It's very hard to look at everyone but it's also not impossible. As you do this more often, you'll be able to do this better, flawlessly. I am looking at everyone. I can look at everyone because I'm very confident. I'm very comfortable. I have no issues. I can go to anyone and speak to anyone. I can engage with anyone because I've done this so many times before. But when you're starting out, I know it's very difficult. It's very hard to connect with each and every one and especially if the audience is larger than this, right? The reason I'm doing this, it's easy for me to connect with each and every one of you because I can come to you. I can make you feel involved, just you, if I'm speaking to you. But if I'm up there, it's harder. And so we use a technique called anchoring. Anchoring is you will find, as you go up there, you will find a few people that agree with you, give you the right energy, that smile at you, and then you always have to move through those people in your talk. That's how you make everyone else feel involved as well. Yes, please. Okay, good question. So she's asking me, if you're in a competition, would you give more attention to the judge or the audience? So if it's a competition, your job is to impress the judges. But you have to make the judges believe that you're looking at the audiences. Because the judges are going to judge you on your ability to hold a crowd. And so you're impressing the judges, but part of what they're looking at you or they're judging you on is how well you are making eye contact with the audience. Do you understand? Here's a trick. One second. Here's a trick. If I were you, you know, um, they spoke about knowing your audience. If it's a competition, if I were you, I would go and learn extra about the judges. Because it's the judges who are judging you. If you understand what judge likes what, that will help you push your talk forward in the way you impress your judges. Because the judges are ultimately who are giving you points. Okay. Um, and if you're being judged by the audience reaction, then forget the judges. Look at the audience. But the point is you have to make the judges believe that you're engaging the audience and you're making the eye contact with the audience. 
Anyone else has, uh, do you want to? It's full of social media pages. You know us. It's food, 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 talking. <laughs> food, <coughs> too. Yes, you had a question? OK, yeah. So I'm coming to the same thing, right? Yes. When you said impress the judges or the audience. But my question is, what do you do standing up there, OK? You have research about the judges. You have cracked a joke. You know, you, have, you know your flow is there. But then suddenly, when your eyes fall on the judges, there is a flat expression. And in that moment, you, you know, for a few seconds, you are blank now. Because, OK, it's not tent, you know, They have to be neutral. But then for that you know, period of time, a small period of time, you go like, oh, shit. Am I doing right? Am I doing wrong? So you know you tend to fall back, and you're like, okay, now I don't know what to do. So how so, do you deal with that when, by you know, it just. So <laughs> if I understand your long question, if you crack a joke and no one smiles, what do you do? No, no, no. It's just if you judge? look at the judges and they, you know there's a flat face. What do you do? <laughs> Some judges are moody. I can I can tell you. You know, not everyone <laughs> is like me, but that's fine. Um, <laughs> um, so look. There are certain things that I think even my previous presenters mentioned that you will have no control over. In life, right, there are three circles. OK, this here comes my motivator. There are three circles in life. The closest circle to you is the circle of control. These are things that you control in life. And then the circle that is ultimately outside it is called the circle of influence. These are the people, things, situations that you can influence. For example, your family members. For example, your workmates. And then the outermost circle is called the circle of concern that you have no influence over. You may not have any control over, but if they change, it will impact you. For example, laws and regulations. And then ultimately, everything outside there is not in your control. So there are things that you can control, and there are things you will never be able to control. So if you focus on the things that you can control, the judge's expression, or the mood, or how they feel about you, will never be in your control. You can only try your best. But don't worry about it too much. Seriously. OK, so body language is important. I need to move on. One of the, we have a question. go ahead. Um, I don't know if it's quite related, but I think it's on the part one and part two. It's based on both questions. What if you are on stage, you came prepared, but let's say you fumbled on your words, and mm. instead you can't just say sorry or something like this. How do you recatch okay. the I'm attention? I'm coming to that, hold that thought, OK? The second thing I want to talk about is Let's talk about the second part here, your tone and voice. How do you think someone sounds when they're telling you a story? Do, do you find them lovable? Do you find them you know, uh, humorous? Do you find them influencing you? Do you find them uh, motivational? Do you find them inspirational? What do you think? What happens when people tell you a story, when speakers tell you stories? We heard uh, Zoreda Bai's classic escapade with the uh, river down the street. Um, what do you feel? Like I was hooked on that story because it was a true story. Um, uh, I understand what Zoreda's strengths are, what her weaknesses are. It was um, funny as well, uh, trying to picture her in that um, shocked or nervous state, shaking almost. What do, you, what do you think? What do you think happens when people speak about a story? What happens? <coughs> you know, I think I'm loud enough. Thank you. Okay, Shirin Bai, can you tell us a monotonous story? I'm so hungry at this point, I don't care. Anything will do. Her, her, her pitch and tone was flat, yeah? The reason you find that captivating is because even though she told a true story, it is the way she said it. It is the control of her voice, the strength of her voice, the power tones that she used, the poses that she made. 
So there are four things, and Farhan sent this to me. Um, there's your pitch. How loud, how soft you are. It's the pace. Dr. Zoreda is an excellent speaker. Dr. Zoreda can be, is not, can be an excellent speaker. It's your pace. If I were to tell you a secret, it's the pose creates suspense. And what's the last one? Power. Pitch, pace, pose, power. It's how much impact you give a particular word or situation. That is everything to do with your tone and your voice. A lot of you go out there, or a lot of us when we're starting out, we go out there because we cram things, because we've sort of, you know, um, taken the context and tried to memorize it. When you go up there, you're just a parrot speaking from memory, not understanding what words, what situations, what narrations need to be stressed on, need to be paused at, need to be slowed down at. When you get up there, like doctor was saying earlier, that you will be anxious, you will have butterflies, you will feel those um, like, what do you say? Butterflies. Like you will feel the adrenaline. You'll feel nervous. And you would want to get it done and over with as fast as you can. And the last thing everyone is thinking about is poses. But when you start understanding what poses do for you, it will be the biggest power that you can use in the way you address the audience. Okay, so those are number two. Yes, please. Yes. When we are talking about things like tone and voice, I have heard people many a time talk about, oh, but I'm an introvert, you know, I'm not used to talking, and the, the, this is a, a very common thing. You can be an introvert and be a good speaker, right? Like I said, it's a muscle that you need to build, you need to understand. Remember that you're doing this with a purpose. There might be a certain character type you are. When you are on the stage, what matters is that you are on the stage and you're there to convey something. So let that not also be a crutch because I've seen a lot of people who have a lot of good potential to speak sort of shy away from that because, yeah, but I'm an introvert, you know, I can't talk to people and I'm not used to. There are some people who are very loud and I'm not one of them. When you are on the, when you are on the stage, you need to be loud, right? So your introvert nature sort of needs to take a back seat yeah. as you engage your audience. That's so by the way, I am an introvert too. I am an introvert, seriously, because I like spending time alone. I'm very happy in my own company. In fact, when there's too much interaction in a particular day, I long for the time to be alone because that's how I refresh myself. So all those things are just up here and some things that you built as a limitation, as an excuse. I sat down and I'm speaking to you to show you that your tone and your pitch can also be controlled regardless of the scenario that you are in. Your eye contact can still be maintained whether you're standing or you're sitting. It's how, you, how much you practice, how good you get. The more you do this, the more comfortable you will be. The more you can use your hands wherever you are, the more you'll be able to modulate your voice, whether you're sitting or you're standing. Make sense? But if you do have a low voice, because some people do, then standing helps you yes. protect it. Yes. If you prefer to stand if you have a low voice by design, because then you can better protect it. 
and to contrast him even if you have a low voice by the way there are exercises that help you use your voice and make it more empowering so there is nothing that should be a limiting factor there are areas there are preferences there are situations that work better for others than you know some it's fine understand what works for you they spoke about what is your style imagine Sadhguru spoke like Barack Obama or who is our reciter Nadim Server right spoke like Bill Clinton it's not their style so understand your individual style okay so we spoke about the body language we spoke about the tone let's speak about the words and language what do you think even though it's 7% there what is the importance of using the right words and language please yeah Fair enough. Is it fair to use uh, different languages, more than one? You think that's possible? Okay, so can I use Gujarati here? I can? Okay. Why? Hmm. But not everyone here speaks Gujarati, do you? Exactly. So you Gujarati bolo cho. Shirin, what do you think? I think it's a 50-50 thing. It depends on the circumstances. Hmm. It depends on the audience. If you're in a formal situation and you're speaking, you can't be suddenly going on into a different language, right? But if you're in an informal situation or if you feel that there are people, especially like we see in our community, in our mosques, that we have lectures that start in English, then they go into Gujarati, and then they end up in Urdu. So what they're trying to do basically is make sure that all three generations are satisfied. Everybody's getting a little, but again, that goes, as I said, circumstantial. Where you are, the place that you are in, the audience that you are catering for. I can just add over here. So here, using multiple languages is fine hmm. because you're getting to know us, you're building a bond, we're getting closer, it makes it easier for you. But also do remember, she spoke about the setup. These things are being shared openly. So people are even learning from you when you go up there. So not everyone watching your video out there understands the different language. And a very different example is what I said was in December when I was presenting at the Ottoman conference. I remember my colleagues as well presenting. We had the local crowd, we had the international crowd, and all over the world just like hi Chalo, we just like map and everybody just started laughing because they didn't understand what's happening. She was very comfortable, overconfident and hence the language changed Yes. He says like a sentence in Hindi. Yeah. And then he'll be like, I know most of you don't understand, but this is what this means. So mm. it adds more emphasis <coughs> to the point that he's trying to make. So even if they are familiar with the language, firstly, you saying it in that language will bring attention to it. So you already captivated their attention, and then you can make a stronger point because you already got their attention. So it depends on the content. Yeah. Yeah. Rather than like my language. What was it again? Job to listen and listen to the teacher, 
the same practice may not work in a room of people, right? Because they don't care about the references. So those are those like knowing your audience and that you are talking about. Where there's a power dynamic, you can sort of push certain things that you know people will have to listen, but in certain rooms that will completely backfire and you end up in So there's also the power dynamic. So, thank you. Um, look, it's contextual to where you are. Who are you presenting to? What are the guidelines? What are the rules of where you're going? So, in a classroom, like for Han said, it's very easy. There's, a, there's a, a master and a slave almost. And whatever the master says, the slave has no choice but to listen. You can't do anything. When you in a corporate room with your peers, maybe you, depending on your relationship with your peers, maybe it's open to be free, to even curse. How many know Gary V? Who knows Gary V? Who knows Gary V? Okay. So go in, when you go home today, go. Google Gary, G-A-R-Y, V, V-E-E. -E. His actual name is Gary Vaynerchuk. One of the best speakers of our time. I relate to him because his speaking style is very much like the way I speak. Confrontational, I'm very confrontational. When you speak to me alone, I use um, adult words in a different setting because that's how I think, okay? And he's the same. But I cannot speak like Gary Vee today, here. So it's contextual. I need to understand what the rules are. I need to understand who my audiences are. So yes, I think bringing your uniqueness, your cultural language or word or two which cracks a joke, good. But is it able to crack a joke? It is able to connect you with everyone else, for example. If I spoke Gujarati, how many people here would connect with me? And would that be a joke? Would that break the ice? Would that be acceptable by the competition, by the judges? So here are my tips. Number one, when you understand your audience, regardless of how knowledgeable you are, simplify your words. Speak as if you're speaking to an eight-year-old. It doesn't matter. You're not here to impress the judges with your intricate use of vocabulary or thesaurus. If you're able to explain a context like you would to an eight-year-old, a lot of times you'd win with your words. So let me give you um, a title, a work title that I, that I hear and I use quite a lot. And tell me what it is. So I met this guy who tells me that he is a hydrobotanical engineer. What do you think he is? Gardener. <laughs> Hydro is water, botanical is plants, engineer. The guy waters the plants. There's a simpler way to say it, but there's a more complex way to say it. So words are extremely important. And the final thing is your presentation. How you dress. How you dress is of utmost importance. I know everyone tells you, oh, it's about the person on the inside and don't worry about all those things. And, you know, it's not about the money. All that is BS, by the way. <laughs> because most people are emotional. Every one of us carries biases. Every one of us has preferences. Every one of us have traditional and culturals that, cultural backgrounds that we come from. And we form a picture of someone. I don't wear any socks, so maybe you're la laughing at me not wearing socks. But people judge you the first time they see you, whether you like it or not. So how you dress is very important when you're up there. And if you're a powerful speaker, if you're a good speaker, by the end of your talk, or your content, or your speech, hopefully you will be able
to sway what the audience or the judge judged you on. But the first impression and how you dress and how you carry yourself is very important. I'd rather say you should be overdressed than underdressed. But that doesn't mean you wear a suit to the beach. Do you understand? Does it make sense? You'd rather be overdressed than underdressed. But do not wear a suit to the beach. Does that point get through to you? Clear? Questions? I'd and like I think to add something here. Yes. So, though Ashik said, don't wear a suit to a beach because like you're overdressed, overprepared. And I, correct me if I'm wrong, but Ashik and I are both of the same thought that it's better to be overdressed than underdressed. You can go to the beach, you can remove your coat, you can roll up your pants and your sleeves, and you can still walk and enjoy in the water. But you can't go in a formal boardroom in shorts and a t-shirt and sneakers. You will not be taken seriously no matter what degrees you have, no matter how well of a speaker you are, because people are visual. The first impression that you make, it leaves a mark in their heads. So if you go underdressed, unprepared, and you expect to you know, make it or bluff your way through, it doesn't work that way. For anything to be successful, there has to be prep work. There has to be content. There has to be preparation to make it. You can't just expect to just do a little bit and come. And over the years, we have seen people who have been so confident that they felt, we'll just come here and say whatever and we'll wing it. You can't always wing it. You have to make sure that you have your content up to perfection. That is why this is a competition. When you are studying, you know, when you study online, when you read something online, it's for your own self. But when you go into a classroom or in an environment where you are with others and you are competing with them, the whole point, and honestly, it is that I should be the best. I should do better than everyone else. The reason that so many of you are here from last year or the year before is so heartwarming for us. We feel so happy. You know why? Because you didn't give up. You didn't make it the first time. You are here again. You are here in today's masterclass to learn, to improve, to take new tools and new tactics on how should I improve myself. That's why we have tried to change our style so that we can give it to you in a different way. But what something that I always say is if plan A doesn't work, there are 25 other letters in the alphabet. Try it in another way. Try getting it to someone else. And make sure that when you are asking, don't belittle yourself. Don't be scared. What will they think? Will they judge me? We are here to give you all the help to empower you so that when you come up there next week, we are the ones thinking, oh my God, am I making the right decision? Is he going to do well or is she going to do well? Am I giving him less marks or am I giving her more? We want to be in that situation where we are confused. We don't want you to be up there where you are thinking. You know, when you're looking at us and you feel that maybe our expressions are not, sometimes some of us play good cop and bad cop. We have this thing between us that we'll just we'll look at you like that. We are inside so excited. Oh my God, I'm so proud of her. <laughs> She's doing so. But we won't show it to you. Because sometimes what happens is when I'm going, oh my God, great. You get so happy, you forget what you're saying. And sometimes when I'm looking at you and you think, maybe I should use more bigger words, better words. Or maybe I should increase my tone or my pitch or whatever. The point is, we are here to make you succeed. We want the best for you. So try and take in whatever we are saying. You know, the more interactive we are trying to get with you guys, the whole point is we are trying to squeeze that out of you. All of you here came for the auditions. You all have something inside you. There's a fire. Now we want that fire to blow up like a big bomb or like a firework so that everybody sees the potential that you all have within you.
Thank you, Sharon Beck. So one thing I'd like to just um, add to that, you know, she said so you many times it. before that you now can do it with your eyes closed. When does someone become an expert? Not that when they do things once and they get it right. That's luck. That's chance. But someone who can do with their eyes closed at 3 a.m. in the morning. Why? Because they've put in the 10,000 hours. They've put in the 20,000 hours. They've put in those, I don't know, 100, 200 days in getting that done. So, to be honest, I think every one of us here, even though Farhan says you, he doesn't like structure, whatnot, we can do this without anything. We can do this without a single piece of note or a structure or anything for that matter. We can sit down and do a question answer session with you and we should be able to cover everything. Sometimes, someone like me, I don't like structure. I think most of the judges here who've been to TEDx, including myself, I didn't like TEDx because TED TEDx confines me. But I think every one of us, one of the aims that we did TEDx in is to prove to ourselves that can we go beyond our limits. So yes, we did it. Is that a preferred style? No. Do I prefer going back to referring to this or using the aid? No. But I'm doing this because uh, Fatima and Hassan will be very angry if I go above time. <laughs> or if I just don't do enough. So I have, for the sake of the impact that we want to create for you, for the community, for the VOC that we've been doing for the last four years, we have to take on certain things that we're not comfortable with, or it's not our preference, or it's not the first thing that we'd like to do, and incorporate it so that we can show you if we can do it after doing it for 20-something years. It's very, very plausible and possible to be done by anyone who takes it up and practices. Understood? Questions before I move on? I'm coming to what you asked. I want to make one last point before I move on. Uh, Zora Bai touched on this. Tools. I just say this, you know, tools should be a supporting thing for you to advance you in your mission, to demonstrate, to exhibit it, uh, numbers or theories or things that you're speaking about. But remember, you are the star of the show. The tools are just supporting actors. If it's a movie, you are the star. Now, let's talk about some of the things that can happen on stage. I asked you to hold the thought. What did you say? What if you stumble or fumble on the words, right? Okay. So how many think that that is uh, an unforgiven sin when you fumble on stage? What words are we talking about? Cat, ball. Yeah. Hmm. Guys, don't, do not raise your hands. I am not your headmaster. I will not be speaking Hindi to you. <laughs> I am not your teacher. Just speak, okay? Yes, but speak louder so I can hear you. The audience don't know what you're going to speak. So even if you mess up somewhere, they don't know what you're going to say. So you can just build it again and speak. OK, anyone else? When you fumble your words. OK. What is the majority of things here? What is it, body language and your tone? Your words is 7%. So yes, you may fumble. Here's things that I would like to do. Number one, when you fumble, when you make a mistake in real life, what do you do? When you're speaking to someone and you make a mistake in a word or a sentence that you wanted to say, what do you do?
What do you do? No, I'm asking you, really. We're at home with your friends. Haven't you never fumbled? Have you ever fumbled? Okay. You have. And then what did you do? Okay. How? Okay. Okay. Move on. Okay. So ignore the audience completely. <laughs> So, way back in the day, before I was speaking well and was doing my content online and whatnot, uh, my, and I think a lot of people have this, I have this problem that my mind has 300 thoughts ahead of what my tongue can support. So, especially you will see this right now when I am angry, I will eat my words. When I'm angry, when I'm angry, so I'm fighting with my partner, but I'm taking like three words away from six words. So she's, it's even more confusing because she doesn't know what I'm saying. Right? That happens to me even today when I'm angry. That's because, like you said, when I'm nervous, I will forget what not. But remember, speaking is something that you do from very early on. And you have your first language, you have your second language. So there is strengths and weaknesses. Two, when you speak to everyone, there is a number of ways that you can do this. When you fumble, you make a joke on it. It's very simple. But duh, okay, this is what I mean. You know why? Because that shows authenticity. There's vulnerability. Oh, this person is just like me. People connect with people that they see themselves in. People want to be relatable. And relatability is not about perfection. Relatability is invulnerability. So, when you make fumbles, you will always make fumbles. I cannot guarantee you that you will not make fumbles. But one way to avoid it is simplify. There is n number of ways of saying something. The simpler it is, the better it will be out there. The less chances for you to fumble. When you do make a fumble, either say it again, the same word, or say, duh, this is what I mean. But how you use your tone, your pitch, will help you overcome that anyway. It doesn't matter. Because your words are only 7% of what really people see. Again, having said that, that does not mean that you make a fumble in every word, in every sentence, right? I expect you to have some level of um, knowledge or expertise in the language that you're using to communicate. Number two, what happens when you forget? What will happen on stage? You will forget. <clears throat> does it happen to anyone? Does it happen to anyone? Okay, so let's ask the experts. Shirinbhai, what did you do when you forgot? I moved on. Okay. Because at that point, if I'm trying to remember something, <coughs> and there's, it's gone, your mind is blank. I think we saw the MC when she started off. Where is our MC? When she started off, she was so excited that when she came up, she forgot. She didn't give up. She started twice. She didn't give up till she got it right the third time. And this is what makes a good speaker, that you don't give up. As I've always said, and I love saying this dialogue, there are three kinds of speeches, mm -hmm. right? I have to, I can't have yes, an event yes, without yes. saying it. There's the speech that you will prepare, there's the speech that you will deliver, and there's the speech that you will wish you had delivered. Even when we go back, we remember sometimes, and I'm always telling them, oh, I forgot to say that point. We're human beings. Chat, CBT or whatever GPT is there to help us. But if we take everything from it 
and please don't take anything of your feet from me because we are going to check and you will be disqualified and you will just fail. Take content, add your drama. See, a good speaker is like a magician. Now, there are two kinds of magicians. Have, there, have you all seen magic shows or clowns or circus or, or even on cartoon? So, one magician is like who comes dressed, you know, in a clown suit or is wearing a suit. He'll remove his hat and a rabbit will come out or flowers will come out or, and you think, oh my God, they're amazing. And then there's some magicians who will be just dressed in a black suit. They'll be wearing a red cape, but they'll be doing all kinds of strange and weird music, I mean magic. See, I fumble. Instead of magic, I said music. But going on, see, you carry your thing forward. You don't just get stuck in where you fumble. You move forward. So going forward, these second kinds of magicians do all kinds of phenomenal acts. They'll make people rise in the air. They'll cut a body in half. If you've seen these magic shows, you'll have seen what they do. That doesn't mean one is better and one is less. What we have to do is if we don't have the magic in us, we have to create it. And having heard what all three of them have said, what you do is you get your content. So that is your tool. Now you want to turn it into magic. Magic doesn't happen just like that. Magic needs some drama. Magic needs some color. Magic needs some story. Magic needs some smoke and fire. And who is all this magic for? The audience. So look at your talk. Look at your presentation. That when you're going to be doing it, you're going to be doing a magic show in front of us. When you're doing a magic show, you want us to be captivated. You want us sitting by the edge of our seat, not checking our phone and looking at each other and rolling our eyes. Where did that come from? So find that inner magic. Look for it. If you can't find it, create it. And if you feel you're not getting to where you want to be, you still have time. Get in touch, ask for help, and we will give you all the props that we have been giving you and a lot more. Any questions? So we'll be seeing a lot of magicians next week. So, sorry, I just wanted to say it was about forgetting, but ask your question and I'll come back to that. Yes. I'll come, I'll, we'll come to that. Yeah. We'll come to that. We have the structure which we will we'll take you through. So that's the last part of what we're going to do. He's giving you all the structural stuff. I'm giving you all the magical stuff. <laughs> but to put it in simple, you want to eat chicken. Okay? Bear with me. I know we are all hungry. You want to eat, suppose, what do you want to eat in chicken? What do you like? Sorry? Chicken pasta. Okay. I hadn't thought of that. I was thinking of cuckoo and chips. But anyway. Let's go to chicken pasta. Now, when you're thinking of chicken, you can already picture or visualize your chicken and your pasta and your either white sauce or red sauce and forking it. Oh my God, I'm hungry. But anyway, so, but before you get to that, your chicken in the pasta was not that chicken. That chicken was running around with its family. That chicken was taken, it was slaughtered, it was sold, oh it was God. cooked. And then it turned into your chicken with pasta. Right? So that's how your speech is. As you're saying, what you think and what you write and what you present are three different things. You want your chicken pasta. So your main focus is going to be your chicken pasta. But you can't have chicken pasta without the chicken. So you need to figure, figure out what is your chicken. What is your main substance? What is your meat? What is the thing that you're going to put in this dish? That is where your topic comes in. And if your the chicken is wearing sunglasses or chains, that's also good for you. It's got personality, right? It adds more flavor. 
So that is very crucial. Once you have your topic, which is the hardest part to figure, because we have sat there and we have literally hit our heads when we've heard the same topic over and over and over and over. So if today also, if those of you who have a topic set, discuss it if you want, so that you're not overlapping or saying the same things, because you want yourself to be unique. See, all of us, we may be all, you know, half women, half men, but we are all individuals. We are all very unique in our own ways. That is why we each have a single <coughs> thumbprint, right? We all have a simple, unique thumbprint or fingerprint, which is unique just to us. Even twins, their fingerprints are different. So what we want to see is what is different, what is special, what is wow, what is magic about you. So to get your main content, get that, work on it so that your chicken turns into your pasta. Any more questions? Can I? Can I? Okay. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, and which I tried to engage in you guys, yeah. but you know, did. Mm -hmm. What do you So here's, I'll give you a true story, a uh, true example. I was invited to. Last year's event. Last year, um, one of the community events. And they caught me in as a speaker to speak for small medium businesses and how to grow your businesses, okay? Um, it was during a fair. And I remember I was doing this uh, for free. I now don't do free engagements anymore. They pay me every time someone wants to um, have me speaking for something. I was speaking to probably uh, 40 or 50 small business owners and there was a time given to me and I was told, please come, this is the time you'll speak. So I get there 15 minutes before, unlikely of me. I'm usually very late, always late, fashionably late. But I was early for that event. Um, they say, okay, fine, you know what, no, this, this is his, and it was a Diamond Jubilee, by the way. The, um, um, the inside hall, which has a stage, for those of you who've been to Diamond Jubilee, and the open area was where all the stalls and carts were. So there, at any point in time, about three or 400 people there engaging with each other, wanting to buy things, so there's a lot of noise. And the organizers say, okay, fine, why don't you get on the stage? And you start speaking. For a speaker, um, to be able to speak in that environment is not only challenging, but it's also insulting. Because if you are getting me there to speak to X amount of people, and hopefully you want me to give them some value. But also, whatever I'm about to give them, I've done a lot of research. There's a lot of years, experience, skills that have gone in for me to prepare this for you. And so when I went up there, I stood quiet. I didn't speak for about 15 minutes. And those guys said, why don't you speak? I'm like, no, because my audience is not here. My audience is not here. And so you keep quiet. And ultimately, they realize this is not going to work out. I said, look, I'm going to, because it's a Jamaat thing, I will do you a favor. I'll come back at the end of the show to do this. But I'm not going to speak here because this is not how I'm going to be able to get to the people that you want me to get to because they're busy selling their stuff. It's unfair of me asking them to leave or not attend their stalls and come and listen to me. They would have done a better job at make, making sure the management is sort of, there is a seclusion for the speakers. But when you find yourself in something like that, the first thing to do is just take a pose. That's what I'm trying to say. When you take a pose, everyone is wondering, there's a speaker on stage, they're supposed to say something. They're not saying anything. It's quiet. Mm -hmm. You capture people's attention. And if you find yourself in a place that you really, really cannot engage, cannot speak, then that space or that audience 
has not been prepared for you or to hear you talk. And so it's better you re-engage it. Okay? But I was going to, we're going to move faster. I think we're, we're at 5.10. What's, what's, what's my time like? Fatima, what time am I supposed to finish? Five? I still have 20 minutes. Oh my God. Okay. So we were speaking about if you forget, what happens if you forget? So Shirin Bai gave you an example. Number one, always have two, three, four different backup stories that you can tell because stories will help you connect. And when you put things within your speech, a story especially, no one knows whether they were supposed to be there or not. And while you're telling a story, you will hopefully remember it again. So always have two or three stories in your pocket that you can tell. It doesn't matter if you've already told it before. It's better than forgetting and shutting up. Second, you forgot. The audience does not know your speech, does not know your talk, does not know your content. So they don't know you forgot. It's exactly what you said. Move on. And you can come back to that point again. Understood? Okay. The third thing that can go wrong, and this is rarely, but it happens, when you freeze on stage. Have you not seen people freeze, like not say anything, can't do anything? Has that happened? Have you seen that? I'd like to add something Please. there. I've seen somebody pee on stage. I'm not joking. Share it by keep it halal, please. I'm telling you. Okay. A few years ago, we had the stage play that we were doing. I won't say how many years ago, a lot of years ago. And we were all participating, and suddenly the person who was standing next to me stopped talking. And she was supposed to give her dialogue, and she's just stopped. She's quiet. So the, the third person there, the third person and I looked at each other and realized that she's nervous. So we try to put in a few words. Suddenly now, as someone like me who cannot stand still, I'm surprised today I'm standing still, but I was moving around and there was a puddle. So I didn't realize, I continued with the drama and she joined in a little bit, whatever, but we could see she was hyperventilating. She couldn't breathe, she couldn't talk, and we thought that she's going to pass out. So at one point when there were some other people practicing or saying whatever their lines were, I grabbed her hand and I whispered to her. Now, we all had mics at that time. But I whispered to her, I said, are you okay? And she goes, I'm so nervous. I can't remember my words. And that what you're walking on, I peed on stage. Now, the first reaction, if you're standing here and someone has peed, is to jump back. Like, oh my God, it's peed. But there's an audience of 1,000 watching you. You can't be doing that, right? The show has to go on. And always remember the show has to go on. So what do you do? You just carry on. We went along. Nobody in the audience knew that this particular person did not say her lines. There were some parts which did not make sense because she was giving the information. But you know what? The show went on. It was a hit and it was over. 20 years later, whenever we meet and we look at her and she says, please don't bring up the peeing on stage story, of course we bring it up, right? Mm -hmm. My point is that you could be shaking, you could be having a meltdown, but if you continue, we won't know. So just don't let it slip to us. You'll fumble, you'll slip, you'll fall, that stage is a little dodgy. Look at it as a challenge. That you know what, if I could just walk as I want, it's so simple. But if I walk not knowing if I'm going to fall down and break my leg, that's more challenging. So now I have double pressure. I have to think of what I say. I have to think of how I walk. Hopefully we'll get the stage fixed. But all these things are part and parcel of your presentation. Today it's this platform. Tomorrow you'll be asked suddenly in your work environment, come and give a speech. You'll be asked in school, in the hospital, wherever you may be. You could be traveling to another country. Something happens and you have to take charge. You don't always get the best of situations or conditions. You have to make do. So learn whatever the environment may be, make the best, whatever you have, push it forward.
So I know I was going to say 20 years ago, there were not digital cameras, so she got away easy. Yeah? Now, you. with the world of internet, it's very hard to get away. So be careful. If you have that problem, I would say just uh, buy a diaper and make sure you wear that. But you can freeze, right? You can freeze. But remember, you are freezing because you're creating a devil in your head, the devil of anxiety. You're creating nervousness in your head because you think the crowd knows what's supposed to happen next. Your superpower is no one in the audience knows how things unfold. It's like a movie. When you go watch a movie for the first time, you may have an idea of the movie if you read the book, maybe if the movie has been made on a book. We spoke about Harry Potter here. You may think you know what's going to happen. You may suspect you know what's going to happen. But still, you cannot be sure. And sometimes, haven't you watched movies that have a great plot twist that change the way you even look at something? And so that is what a winning talk is about. No one knows you froze until you freeze and you show that you froze. Understood? And the final thing I think I'll touch through very fast is ready for surprises. You have to be adaptable. You have to understand that you may never have perfect conditions. I speak online, I make content on video and whatnot. And the first video I made, I say this, I've said this before, it took me 52 to 55 tries. 55 takes for me to make a two minutes video. Today, it doesn't matter. You put me in front of a camera, I will do it without doing anything. To go further, I wanted to challenge myself. Last year, I started doing videos in Swahili. It's not that I don't know Swahili, but my problem was every time I was speaking Swahili, even in a press conference in my corporate world, I was translating everything to English. The moment I let go of that, my Swahili was flowing like proper. So um, be ready for surprises, whether it's stage not being ready, whether it's the type of setting. The reason I wanted to do this today <clears throat> is because you will not always be on a stage. You'll, always, you'll not always have an audience from one side. You will not always have the mic. You will not always have to impress the judges. Sometimes you will be put in a place where you're surrounded, 360, and you have to talk to everyone, and you have to engage everyone, which means when you're engaging one part, your back will be facing another part. And in public speaking, you never put your back towards the audience. But in real life, no matter what the rules are, surprises are a constant. So remember that. Yeah, it's how you manage the 360 degrees audience is how you win. You want to say something? Yes. What happens? So, okay, again, I'll take you back to human elements. When you are with your closest group of friends, can you remember the kind of talks that you have? Do you think those talks would be okay to come out in the public? It's nonsensical. 
it's stupid. It's downright dumb sometimes, right? But you guys laugh your heads off, don't you? Don't you? I mean, no judgment. I have my Friday nights with my boys where we talk about absolutely... You'll be surprised we talk about those things. Stupid jokes. They won't even make sense. And sometimes we have this thing on Facebook that we tease each other. People don't even know what we talk about. That's how silly it is. So, what I'm trying to get to is the audience, there's humans in the audience, there's no machines. And so contextual to them is the joke. Do they understand? Are they from the background? Do they even relate? And sometimes people pretend to be listening to you, they're not listening to you. They're thinking about that bread uh, pie or meat pie they need to have at iftar today. You cannot put your, um, I guess, disapproval or your lack of landing a joke well because someone else did not react. Yes, one of the measurements of how you're doing is the audience, audience's reaction and relatability. But do not let that be determined by one simple joke that did not land well. It's ultimately about your content and I'll speak about that in a moment. Okay, so here's what happens. I wanna, this is my last section and I think we're done after that. Um, these lots spoke about before. I wanna speak about on. So in a, in a, in a talk, what usually happens? If you really want to engage your audience, if you really want them to relate to you, whether your jokes land or not, if you really want them to pay attention, this is what you need to do. Remember your talk. To have these blocks, he spoke about how you start well. Your starting should be amazing, right? So this is where you start from, okay? This is what I call the current state. which is also known as what is. So if you're starting a topic, you can introduce people to what is this thing like today? Or what issues does this thing have today, for example? Always present it as a villain, as something that is a problem, or these are things that are happening today in the world. And as you move forward, this is where you, so this is the beginning, this is the end, this is the middle, right? So it's the opening, the closing, and the body. So this is what happens. As you start describing the current state, you need to move on to what I call the dream state. You want people to be able to dream, show them, promise them, make them believe something even if it's outright out of this world, even if it's impossible, this is your job in the middle. It's dreaming. What could be? And then you may have to do that a few times. Give, you know, when you spoke about the strong opening, that give them a shocking fact or ask them a question. Use a prop. You may have to use some of it here just to maintain the attention. And then this is what we call the promised state. So you started with the current state. You made someone dream and then you're ending with the promised state that has to be better than the current state. which is also the new state. Your audience will never have their attention on you like this throughout the speech. Your audience, when you come in, everyone is judging you. Remember we spoke about when they see you, they judge you. Wearing socks, no socks. Wearing scarf, no scarf. Hair, make, makeup. 
bad beard, what not, whatever. Your interest of the audience peaks and as you start, it starts going down. It's your job to make sure it happens and then you end here. So when you're on stage, you need to have a few things up your sleeves, whether it's stories, whether it's anecdotes, whether it's stunts if you want to use stunts, whether it's props if you want to use props, whether it's questions, whether it's engagement, whether it's games or activities, so that you can take them from the current state, keep them glued towards the dream state, and then show them a promised state that is better than the current state. And this should be your structure when you're on stage. Remember what Shiring Bai was saying, magic? The content you research, what not, figure out how you can present this content in this manner. So here are some of the tips and tricks. We were speaking about when you forget, uh, who's asking? I write this down and then and I come up here and what not. And so there's a few things that you can do. When you understand your content, when you know the structure that you want to apply it to, even though you, if someone has a method of learning through writing down, through reading, through practicing with their people. Remember, do what I call Q words. What are these Q words? A set of words that you can use to remember your beginning, your middle, and the end. And when you go back and understand the concept of what you're trying to say, don't cram the definition. But what does the definition mean? So when you, you know, one of the things that um, when you go through uh, GCSE, who's done GCSE, who's, who's doing GCSE here? Okay, so the difference between GCSE and NECTA is in NECTA they will want you to write the definition word by word. In GCSE, if you explain what the definition means, they give you full marks for it. So understand what the definition means and don't remember the definition. Which means, if you understand what your start is going to be, your middle is going to be, your end is going to be, and you have words as cues of where you are in your talk, it is a very easy way for you to not forget things. Don't worry about the definition. Worry about what the definition means. And if you are able to explain it to yourself, what the definition means, there is n number of ways you can say that out to your audiences. So I'll give you an example. I'm from technology. Have you heard of, everyone uses internet here? Yeah? Okay, have you heard of something called bandwidth? 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 You say your bandwidth is high, low, fast, slow. What do you think bandwidth is? What is bandwidth? So here's what bandwidth is. Basically, the bigger your bandwidth, the faster your speed. But what is bandwidth to someone who's not technical? Internet is an exchange of data. So bandwidth is think of it like a big highway that I'm creating from your computer to the world. And the width of that road is the amount of bandwidth you have. So if you have 10 MB, 10 MB can allow 10 cars at the same time to pass on that highway. If there are 100 cars, what's going to happen? They're going to be queued. So either I pass lesser cars or I extend the width of my bandwidth, the highway. That's what it means. That is the layman's explanation of what bandwidth is. And that is how you do not remember the definition, but you do understand the concept of what you're trying to say. So understand your content well, that you should be able to explain in three, four, five, six, 275 different ways, regardless of the definition. And the Q words help you go through this state. Understood? Questions? So the internal Q words are very interesting. The second thing that you must have to do and start with the end in mind. You know, we spoke about when you forget, when you freeze, what not. The end in mind 
If you start with that, you know what you have to get to. You know the key takeaways that you want to give your audience. Even if you fumble in, the, in between, that's where your, the two, three pocket stories that you've kept are going to help you. And then you go into the end in mind. What is the end that you're trying to deliver? What is the promised state that you want your audience to remember? So start with the end in mind. That's my tip number two. Tip number three. So engaging the audience is of utmost importance. And one of the few things that I do, and I think everyone did today, is telling stories. OK? Now, I'll give you one more tip. Sometimes telling a story, one after the other, one after the other, becomes too much. So imagine, she told the story, very good. He told the story, she told the story, and I tell you a story. You know, I don't like to be with the crowd. I am an outstanding Shia. I stand outside the mosque. Do you know what that means? I'm an outstanding Shia. I stand outside the mosque. So why should I be with these Shias? I'm not a Khoja. I don't want to tell you a story. I want to be different. I want to be remembered. So I don't tell you a story. <coughs> so the other tip that I'm trying to tell you is when you want to engage your audience, story after story after story after story becomes too much. So what do you do? What do you think you should do? What would you do? Would you do anything? But I'm saying I'm tired of stories, so I don't want you to use the story. What would you do? You do a skit. So you can do yoga. You do an activity, okay? Experiment, okay? So what are those things? I want you to be specific. What can you do? What else can you do? Yeah. Brilliant. So here are some of the things that you can do. Dr. Zoreda did a little bit of it today. Props. You can bring in props in the middle of your talk. Just make sure it's arranged very well that you can use. Second, show a video. So there was one of the, I think, uh, first year, second year, I showed a video while I was doing my presentation of how I fumbled in my TED talk. And there wasn't a fumble by me. It was a, an AC going wrong, and someone was trying to fix the AC. I had to wait for the AC to be fixed before I could go on. Be ready for surprises. But I was showing that video. So props show video of something other than you that supports your content, that supports the dream state that you're talking about, that supports eventually your promise state. Three, do activities. There is no hard and fast rule. As you get better, that you have to start with the activity. You can pause. You can tell everyone in the middle to stop, let's do this activity. And Again, as all of us have mentioned, not all of you have to do it because 
and it's just me. It's fine. It's fine. It's just me. So. Okay, yeah, but valid point. And the final tip I want to give you is engage someone from the audience to come and be part of your talk. Right? So there is the video, there is the activity, there is props, and there is the member of the audience that you can get on stage to help you support your mission. Final point I'll make before I go ahead is what uh, Farhan was saying. So there are five things that you can really, really do really well when you want to win the talk, which is inspire people or motivate them, tell stories because it helps you connect with them, right? Um, give them something to take away, the promise state. Be authentic. There is nothing that can replace you. There's only one of you. You can choose styles, but don't be like someone else. I can never speak like Farhan or Doctor or Shirin Bhai. I know they can try speaking like me, but I can never do it like them. Right? The only thing they'll not have is tattoos like I do. But it's very hard to be someone else. It takes a lot of effort to be someone else. The authenticity always helps you win and connect better. And the final thing is rules, regulation, time. Nothing matters if you don't stick to your time, especially in a competition. If you're being measured on time, no matter how good you are, no matter how much emotion you have, no, much, uh, no matter how many stories you tell, how well you engage, what promise you give us and how you give us your takeaways, if you don't make it on time, those takeaways will never even be seen and you will be stopped. Okay? Now, I'll tell you one final story because I have to give you a story and I'll let you go. Because they will feel left out because I didn't give you stories like they did. So I have to be nice to them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. At the end of the day, I'm still a Shia. So, first remember, every speech, every talk is a public speech. Whether it's to one person or a thousand people. Now, there was an experiment done. I heard this the online the other day. I think it's so apt for this forum. There was an experiment done by somewhere in the US, some professor who was teaching arts to the students. He had two classes. He goes to the first class, uh, and this was pottery making. You know how pottery uh, pots are made? There's this big wheel. They take the clay, they put it on that middle thing, and then they use their hands to make uh, clay pots. So he went to the first class and says, in 30 days, I want you to make me one perfect pot. Okay? And he goes to class number two. He said, in 30 days, I am going to give you points or brownies or whatever it is for as many pots that you can make. The first class has been told that you cannot, every time you get, uh, if, you, if you do a mistake, if the pot is not well, you start from the same clay. The second class is told, it doesn't matter. You can make as many pots as you can. For every pot, you will get one point. But these guys will get a thousand points for one perfect pot. What do you think happened? Anyone's heard this story before? What do you think happened? Quality and quantity. Okay. So who won? Quality. The one that was making the best pot. Okay? I think the other one you, think, you think the other one won? Okay. Anyone else? Did you want to say something? Yes, say. So the class two won, by the way. Why? Not only did they make more pots, they kept on making pots, they kept on making pots, and the pots that they came up with were far superior than the person that, or the class that was trying to make one perfect pot. What is the takeaway? Is everything that we've told you today, right? Everything that we've shown you today, 
can only help you become the master speaker that you want to become with as many times as you make your own pots. The more times you do this, the better you become. I promise you, if I'm again in VOC next year, I will be better than this myself. So remember that. Thank you. Very, very well explained. I'm sure all of us have learned a lot from these two sessions over here. Keep in mind that whatever you have learned will not only help you in the competitions, but it will actually run a long mile helping you throughout your personal and professional dealings in life. Since we're already in this setup, we'll just move on to the Q&A session first. So if any of you have got any questions for both the judges on the session one and session two, on whatever is spoken, whatever is not spoken, this is your chance. So just raise your hand and I'll pass you the mic, okay? Come on, no questions? So I was once told that when delivering a speech, I should extrapolate more data, given more information, and I shouldn't make the speech all about myself. But now that also depends on the topic that you are speaking about. So for instance, if it's supposed to be an informative speech, but also has an element of uh, um, personalization to that, where do I draw the line? How much data should I put in? How much information should I feed the audience? How much of my story should I give in? And then considering the graph that um, uh, Ashik presented over here, which was, Start from the current state and then you know take them all the way to the dream state and then end with a promise state. How do I do that with the data that I've extrapolated from different sources and then with my personal story? It sounds a little complicated, doesn't it? <laughs> Who are you asking? Who are you asking? Okay. Thank you. Um, adding to that, I think it all starts, like he said as well, uh, researching your audience. So if I'm going in a business meeting, statistics and numbers are extremely important. 
because I need to project that, for example, if I'm asking for $10 million, why am I asking for $10 million? What are those $10 million going to do for me? Where is it going to be used? What is the outcome is going to bring me? And then I can bring in my personal story and say, why do I believe that I need the $10 million to do this? So it's on your audience. Um, for example, uh, when you go to the government or NGO scene, whatnot, they talk about the numbers and the technical terms because they're saying, you know, so the promised, for example, I, I, I was in Uganda. Uganda has one of the highest medical research facilities and the most, I guess, um, the most uh, best known or well known or well uh, established in East Africa, if not the rest of the Central Africa and East Africa. We didn't know about this. They did this because Uganda was battling with the HIV um, pandemic or HIV problem for the last 20, 30 years. When they went to the World Bank or whoever they went to, or WHO, they said, here's the problem we have, the current state. We're getting infected by X amount of percentage in our population. That is the promised state that we want to go to. So we want to reduce the HIV infections. The dream step is going to be as we do this, we'll have less mortality, we'll do more education, we will do A, we'll do B, we'll do C, and we need $10 million for this because the $10 million will go and impact 35 million people, and this is how it will impact. These are the regions, this is what it, you see. It's depending on the audience and how much of the technicality or statistics that they need to see. So in this context, again, I think if your content or your topic has numbers that it needs to come out, show high level and then move on. If your audience needs more details, then do more details, less of this, but still you can use the same structure in that. So I've. <laughs> That's true. Huh? You want to move? I'm good. Let me help you. Should I'm I? good. I'm good. Sure. I'm good. So I've asked this question quite a few times, but I want to know from the judges themselves: uh, Can I make my topic religious? Because I am very passionate about religious topics. Other than I would make it relatable to the world and the current times and myself, but I want to make it religious. So a religious yeah. topic. Is that okay with you guys? Would you guys like nice. it? Or Example. Give us an example of what um, you're thinking. Yeah. During the auditions, I talked about uh, taqwa, tawakkul, and the, how we can say mara aytu illa jamila. How are we preparing for the imam of our time? And how we can say mara aytu illa jamila like Bibi Zainab. So. Okay, so let me ask you very, thing, very simple. Um, let's say you're being judged not by this, by some other judges, let's say non-Muslim, uh, multicultural, right? Mm -hmm. How would you speak about your Imam then? I would explain them who my Imam is to me first and then speak about it. But that wouldn't really be possible because But do you know the Mahdi is not for you only? Yeah, I know. It's for everyone. It's, it's universal. So yeah. how are you going to portray Mahdi universally? I'm going to take each and every religion and 
put the Mahdi from their perspective. But Mahdi does not belong to religion. Mahdi is for humanity. I'm confused. <laughs> okay, so my personal, and I'll let these guys, my personal thing is whenever you're speaking about religion, it's a very personal thing. Islam is very personal to me, it's very personal to you. There's fundamentals of Islam that are similar. I am in a journey to self-discover, my submission to Allah and everything that is created, the cosmos. You are on the same journey. You may be ahead of me in the journey of self-discovery and whatever Allah has created. And I may be behind, but everyone has to take that path now. When you speak about religion, because everyone is at different levels, when you speak about what you're speaking about and you make sure it's confined in a religious thing and not give it in a universal context, that's where the problem becomes. Because it's a very personal thing. People start getting offended. People start contesting you. People start um, having issues that, no, I think you did something wrong and this is guna and will send you to hell, which is none of that. There is only one judge in Allah. Just because someone else sins differently doesn't mean that you are going there and they're not going. And no one can tell you, even if the keyboard police or uh, Jamaat warriors in the world can never tell you what's going to happen to you except Allah. But how you present it in a public forum is extremely important that you make it universally appealing for me. So, yes, speak about religion. But give me a universal appeal on it. I mean, just a similar answer, I would say. It's like, factually speaking, there is no problem with the religious movie. You know, we've never had an issue. We've had a lot of religious, you know, presentation, etc. I think the key, as Ashik mentioned, is to make it related. Like, again, remember, when you are coming to talk about religion here, even, like, even without thinking about religion, Muslim, not Muslim, even within religion, right? Mm -hmm. Like, don't structure it like a Hausa class because your audience is not that, right? So the key is how do you make it passionate but relatable, right? And keeping in mind that in the crowd, again, not everyone will be at the same level of understanding, at the same level of emotion, at the same level of, right? So how do you, and that's why I said it's very similar to what Ashik is saying just slightly differently, is that how relatable do you make it to everyone in the audience, right? I'm just going to say one thing here. Whatever your topic, make sure you know it so well, because the judges have the liberty to ask questions at the end. So sometimes when it's a general topic, you can still play around with your words, which will still show that you're confident with what you're giving, although you may not know the correct answer, and that you're standing up to a challenge and you haven't succumbed. If you're talking about a topic that has mm. authentic details, remember in the crowd we have people who know, who may not know, but those who even know a lot more. So you have to be very precise with your answer with certain topics, which could also be religious or statistics or what the world is going to. That's exactly what I said. When you're choosing your topic, just be very careful because you cannot give wrong facts. And the example I gave with Bagyata, it's very close to our hearts. And that is why I say that everybody looks at it differently. We have to respect what's happening. We have to support whatever it may be. Sensitive talk. So I'm not saying don't do religion. It's, it's lovely. We've had people talk about Imam Ali on stage with so much passion. And they did well as well. But when the Q&A comes, we're the devil's advocate. And we will always try to ask something that you may not know or something that you may know. So just choose your topics. Really. That's why I will never speak about mental health in front of her. Right, because she'll always make me retarded. Any other question? <laughs> so, coming to what Farhan said, that um, you thrive on impromptu, right? You cannot do structure. So somewhere I'm like that. I cannot do structure. I thrive on impromptu. But the problem comes in the flow. So like when you're speaking in a competition, how do you and sure, okay, it's impromptu. You have written your speech, but you cannot thrive with that because things are in your head and you know you can speak better than what you can write. So then how do you ensure that you have a flow while you don't have a structure, but it's in your head and you can deliver it efficiently without talking too much and without talking too less? So what I would say is that you have to 
add to that, you know, always make sure that whatever your topic is or whatever your speech is about, there is a head, there's the main body and there's a conclusion. So if you keep that in mind, even if you haven't written it down, the beginning will be an introduction. And then once you've introduced your topic, you're building towards it. So you're adding all the main content. Now that you've added your main content, you have to finish it up to close the whole thing. So if you don't want to, if you're not good at writing, pictureize, visualize. Where is your beginning? Where is your main structure? And how are you going to conclude it? That helps a lot. By the way. Um, one final thing, everyone, everything that they said, for you to be a spontaneous speaker and do really well, you have to be an expert at your topic, remember that. So we're speaking about public speaking. We've all been speaking publicly for the last 10, 15, 20 years. So the fact that we could come through so flawlessly, impromptu, spontaneous, on the spot, is because we've been doing this in and out, in and out, in and out. So we know this topic here. If you ask some of us to be impromptu, spontaneous, in a topic that we're not so well worse with, we may not fare so well as well. So it's also about the knowledge that you hold. So I will, like I said, I will never go speak about, and I get invited to speak in a forum that speaks about mental health. I will never go and speak. I'm still struggling with my own mental health. <laughs> okay, imagine me going out there and speaking about mental health. I'm confrontational. I may depress people on the crowd. That's not my forte. You call me for personal development, you call me for business building, you call me for entrepreneurship, you call me for kicking someone else's, whatever it is, or winning, I will come and do it. But there are things that I will not take on because that is not my forte. That is not my lane. Understood? The most important thing is practicing. Once your speech is done, don't wait till the last minute to practice it. Practice it at least 20 times. 20 times. And also when you're practicing, you won't have a mic system at home. So what you need to do is to be able to throw your voice. One way of throwing your voice is imagine your child or your brother or sister taking your phone and running away with it. 
if anyone's running with the, my phone, my voice will go to the next country. You know? Mm -hmm. So learn and practice because if you think on that day when I come, I will be able to, you won't be able to. Like today, continuously talking, our voices, our throats are sore because yeah. we're thirsty and we've been talking non-stop. Well, they've been talking a lot more. But. Mm -hmm. So when you have to do that, practice at least 20 times. So what happens is by the time you've reached the 15th time, you know what you're going to talk. And after the 15th time, you're also putting in expressions on your face. You're, but the first four or five times when you're practicing, you'll be practicing like this. You'll be reading your speech, you'll be trying to understand, to get the words, the flow. After the first five times, you have understood what you are trying to say. After the first ten times, we will understand what you are trying to say. Do you see what I'm trying to say? So, practicing is as important as your content. Here's a, here's a, yeah. Well, almost, I had a very good idea as you're speaking. There is an online coach, uh, Australian. His name is Wim, very smart. Um, he has this method. If you want to know how, how to better yourself, record yourself mm. with that speech. Okay, and the way you listen to it, the first time, switch off the sound and just look at yourself and see how you look and feel, what's your expression like. The next time around, do not look at the video, just listen to how you sound. And the third, look at all of it together. As you do that more, you'll be able to tell what mannerisms, what actions, what your posture you need to change in, how you need to adjust your tone, um, your pitch, the pace, the power, and how you look when you combine them all. Okay, so uh, I just remember that when you're saying that, I think using to record yourself and then looking at, at yourself like that also helps you. Okay, I'm sure everyone's up, right? questions are answered. Okay, one last question, and then we'll move on to the last part. Suppose you have a story and uh, your audience may know of that story, but then this is the only story that connects with your topic really well. Do you still recommend to say that story or choose another one? So are you, t are you telling me that the story is well known by the audience? Is that yeah, what you mean? It might be well and known. there is no way that you can tell another story? It's the only one that connects perfectly. So how many people are in that story? Only one person. Only one person. Is there, is there a way that you can look at that story from someone else's perspective? No, I don't think so. Okay, so I don't know which story you're talking about, but if it's a really universally moving story, then it's fine. So for example, we, uh, Dr. Zareda was saying last year we had someone who was speaking about Imam Ali. The story of Imam Ali, you can hear it so many times, and it's fine. It helps you connect. It's the message that you want to take out now at the end of the day is what's important now. If it's that universal of a story. The other way to look at the story is if there are three people in the story and people usually use person A to tell the story, can you look at it from person C's perspective? That's how you tell the same story from a slightly different angle. Or maybe speak about what you feel when you listen to that story. That was I was going to say. My answer was going to be a third presentation, which was exactly this, that like even if it is, so first of all, I, I feel like no matter how long a story is, it's very difficult to, for me to assume that everyone in the crowd knows it, number one, right? Like there will be, and I think there's, there's that unique perspective which comes from you. So rather than, 
example because as, as much as we are you know, quite tired of hearing about social media, do you remember when I mean, the kids presented it? And I'll even say the name when you we were judging the primary school, right? So, you know, another story, but like we've heard that topic so many times, but we were judging a, a public speaking competition that was for primary school students. And there was this one girl who presented the same social media topic, but she did it in such a unique way, in her own perspective, that even though we've heard that a million times, she still heard the word, right? Because it was, yes, a very common topic, etc. I, I think what gets us Style. sort of, you know, tired of topics is when they are presented in the same weeks, like, you know, everyone will come and they'll tell you social media is bad, it has got us addicted, it has changed our attention span, like, you know, there's, but there's a way, and you need to find that way, I guess that's the trick, and that unique way will come if you choose to think about it uniquely, right, so it's, it's very possible to say things that people have heard, but think about how you can make it uniquely yours. Magic. Add your magic, right? Okay. So we move to the last bit of our event today. Firstly, I request you all to please move back to your tables. On stage to please take you through this bit. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. So, how do we find the, the day so far? I can see some people yawning. Yeah? No. Was it boring? Enjoyable? Yeah. I can't hear you. Silence is golden. Huh? Si they're saying silence is golden. Does it mean you're accepting it or you're scared of the judges? They did judge us, so they better take Ah, okay. No, I don't think they're going to judge you guys today, especially if they know you're judging them next week. <laughs> but I, I really hope on a serious note that you do take away a few points uh, for, pre pre for your preparation in the coming week or weeks. Um, there was a lot mm -hmm. that was shared today, you know, it's and uh, we've been doing this for the, fo uh, for the fourth minutes, year. Seven. And every time I come and attend the session, I take away something new. Uh, so, the other thing I want to just add to say is that public speaking uh, has its own personal style, okay? We were just discussing earlier about how some of you or some of us are impromptu, cannot write out a speech, can just get up on the moment and uh, deliver, and there are others like myself who need to be prepared. So, it is your journey. And don't, uh, you know, try to live in any other shoe or shoes for that matter. Yeah? I just hope that wherever the next few weeks take you, uh, you've gained something from this uh, session today and the, the next week's session, and you practice public speaking. Because like I think Farhan said, that this is something that uh, you have to carry on for life. Yeah? So I won't keep you very long. Um, I just want to go through some of the housekeeping rules for the coming weeks. And uh, Fatima will share this. Oh, by the way, I should say that, um, have you all met Fatima at the back? No. Yeah? No. OK. Can we give her a round of applause as well, please? Yeah. 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 Fatima, uh, Ashik's requesting if you can come up. Yeah. yeah I <laughs> she said she'll come next year. <laughs> no, but. Um, no, you know, you all know Fatima, right? No. She's, uh, her and Ali, I must say, are definitely the backbone of this whole competition. And I do really appreciate all the time that they are putting in. Uh, and of course, the judges. Um, for Hans, first time being the judge, but he's been with us throughout these last four years. And, you know, uh, it is a team effort, and I really do appreciate each and every one of you. Thank you. Uh, so thank you as well. Appreciate it. Um, so... 
we are going to have the semi-final round next week, that's 23rd of March. Uh, that's three days after Fatima's birthday, so just remember, we'll wish her a happy birthday next week. Um, it says TEDx talk style, but I think, you know, we'll just omit that because there's a lot of debate going on about the type of uh, uh, method you want to use. Five minutes to deliver. So the point about the props and using the PowerPoint and using the experiment, you know, just please keep it in mind, okay? Because we are very particular with time. There is going to be a cues for you and marks will be lost if you go above that, beyond that. Uh, in terms of who goes first, it will be randomized, okay? So it's fair for all. We have the same four judges here. Uh, in the finals, there'll only be three judges, okay? But for the semifinals, all four will be here. And uh, we will announce the semifinalists next week at the end of the program. So you will know who is going through to the final round and who is going to uh, be a semifinalist uh, on 23rd March. I don't want to go through what the judge are judges are expecting. In your my clear bag, you already have what it is that you are going to be assessed against. Um, just want to uh, you know, state that you know, really it is up to you what you want to speak about, but it is what you make of it that counts. Yeah? Um, and of course, the judge's decision is final. Alhamdulillah, for the last three years, <laughs> we haven't had any appeals. Um, but I just want to put it on record that uh, uh, at the end of the day, this is a competition and uh, you know, we live by the spirit that we respect the decisions that are you know, made by uh, the judges. Okay? You have five minutes to prepare. These are just a list. <laughs> I will not go through this list, but we have spoken a lot about social media, COVID-19, even if it doesn't exist, maybe you can talk about another pandemic. These are just examples, okay? You don't need to stick to this. By the way, this will go onto the WhatsApp group, so don't worry. Um, yeah, and, and, and I'm not done yet, sorry. If I can just go back. Yes. Um, you have to submit your topics to Fatima by 21st of March, 2024, which is the Thursday, okay? So you have Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, you've essentially got five days to do that. If you are going to be using a PowerPoint, please send it on the same day as well. Okay? And I don't want to go through this again because it's already in your, in your uh, my clear bags, okay? But they're the four main things we are looking at and each will be assessed out of a score of five. Next, is there anything else? That's the end? Yeah? Okay, so we're done for the day. And uh, I hope, I look forward to seeing you next week, inshallah. I hope there are no dropouts. Yeah? Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you.